I'm a developer advocate with Explosion. We're the makers of Spacey, um, the open source NLP library, and also Prodigy, which is a super cool annotation tool. Um, I started interning with them about six months ago, a few months after I finished my undergraduate degree. Um, my academic background is in linguistics, but I've fallen in love with programming and machine learning after doing a few really cool projects on my own, and then of course with Explosion as well. I'm really loving being involved in this open source software thing, educating the community around Spacey, and I've learned really so much in the past six months. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about one of the components within Spacey that I have been exploring. Um, all right, so how do we deal with entities within entities and certain entity extraction problems? Uh, today, we're gonna to be answering that with this cute cat, which is the mascot for Spacey's Span Cat or Span Categorizer Pipeline component. All right, so we're gonna be looking at two examples uh, throughout the presentation. In the first one, we're doing some analysis of the recent crisis. <laughs> we're looking to extract uh, names, organizations, and dates, times, substrings from a document. We can look at this crazy situation with FTX. I can't really believe what's been happening with that. So I decided to put it in here <laughs> um, between this and what's going on with Twitter. I uh, thinking maybe AI should probably just take over humanity uh, sooner <laughs> rather than later. So anyways, uh, for this first example, these uh, substrings are called named entities. Uh, Sam there is a um, named entity. And in order to extract them from a text, uh, you'd use a named entity recognition machine learning model. Spacey has one of these, uh, works pretty well for situations like this. Uh, with typical named entities like people, organizations, or dates, uh, these substrings are mainly proper nouns. Um, they're composed of tokens with clearly defined boundaries. Um, so that's kind of why they're called named entities. Um, there's a lot of different applications for this type of model. There's a lot of different reasons why you'd extract names and organizations from a text, as you might imagine. Um, so moving on to the second example. Um, the substrings you're labeled here look a lot different than the ones in the top example. So in a gist, the problem here, and we'll go into this more, is we're trying to figure out whether certain conditions are being benefited or worsened from a review of a medication. So we label all the conditions in green there. Um, the positive effects are benefits in pink and the adverse drug effects, ADE, in yellow. These substrings, the ones labeled there, aren't really entities. They're not the typical spans you want to extract from a document um, and named entity recognition. Instead of being proper nouns, like in the first example, they contain a lot of different syntactic units. They're longer, they're arbitrary, and a bit more complicated, um, and they even overlap in some cases. This is a tough problem because the model you would use to solve the first example, the named entity recognition model, uh, doesn't do these types of arbitrary labeled spans, and it definitely doesn't do these overlapping spans. So we need a model that goes beyond the typical entity recognition, beyond typical entities, and that handles a wide variety of these labeled spans. Um, within a text. So, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, so these are two different problems. In the top example, we're labeling these clearly defined tokens, these proper nouns, and we train a named entity recognition model to learn how to identify these. And in the second example, we have much different labeled spans, things that are not named entities. Um, and that means by design, a named entity recognition model will not work. So luckily, the Spacey team has come up with a solution, which is a model that can learn to recognize these non-entity spans. OK, so in this talk, I'm going to start by introducing a bit about what named entity recognition is, what problems it solves, and how exactly it does that. I'll then go into what problems it doesn't solve as easily and how we might look at solving them instead. We'll take a dive into Spacey's SpanCat component, how it works, its use cases, and the differences between SpanCat and NER. I'll be connecting all of this to the two examples we saw before, so you'll get pretty familiar with them. All right, um, so in natural language processing, uh, named entity recognition is the task of extracting entities like people, organizations, or dates from a text, as we saw. There's lots of different types of entities you might want to get, and some data sets like the onto notes, if you know it, there might be upwards of like 10 different types of labeled uh, entities. The applications are really broad for this. Um, the spans that the named entity recognition model will extract have clear token boundaries, comprised of the same syntactic units, proper nouns, so they have very low internal structure. They're very simple, easy to pick out. Um, we're going to look at a very brief overview of how that works, um, just so you can get a sense of why it works very well for this type of labeling, but may maybe why it might, might not look so well for some of the later situations. 
Okay. So in any R model, we'll take a sentence and then create an array of labels to tag individual tokens with. Uh, these labels come in two forms. The beginning labels start the span, and then the intermediate labels come for each subsequent token. So each token is classified into this given set of entity labels. Um, a token cannot have more than one label, and each token is classified independently, so it's very sensitive to these boundaries. The outputs are tagged left to right, and then the next tags will have some sort of dependency to the tag that came before it. Um, so it entangles the predictions and provides a certain set of context um, to the later tokens. Um, the model tries to find the most likely output sequence for any given input. Um, but again, it's a sequence where each in input token only gets one output label, and each token is tagged independently. This sort of model works very, very well for proper nouns uh, named entities. As you might say, that's why it's called that. Um, it's designed this way. And there's a lot of problems that can be solved using this approach. Um, it's a pretty popular model because of the wide variety of these applications, and it's gotten to be very, very good. It's done, it does what it's designed for, as one might expect. Um, oh. However, when you start to look at some named entity recognition type problems, you begin to see that they might pose a problem for some NER models. Um, Okay, so going back to the second example on the first slide, um, we're going to look to extract the medical conditions from the review of a prescription drug with the hope of finding out whether certain conditions are benefited or worsened by the drug. So this review is not quite real. It's been changed a bit for simplicity's sake. Um, in practice, the reviews I'm working with do not look this nice. <laughs> in fact, this would probably be flagged as a bot review in any normal pipeline, but we're just gonna do a bit of a pretending for now um, so I can get the point across. <laughs> so um, with this example on the slide, there's several substrings that we might be interested in in order to be able to solve this problem. Um, in the sentence, we'll label all the conditions, uh, which is the substring containing the medical symptom that can be benefited or worsened by medication. So here in this example, that would include the joint pain, the dizziness, and the headaches. Um, our condition span should be the simplest form of the condition, but without excluding important information. So for example, we'll take uh, joint pain as one labeled substring because pain is not quite specific enough, especially if you're talking about certain types of medications. Um, but as you can see, these aren't your typical named entities. In fact, they're not really entities at all. Um, this is a special problem but let's, let's see if we can try, still try to solve it within an NER model. So if we were to try to solve this with NER, uh, we would label the spans and then train an NER model to recognize them. Um, based on previous experience I've had, I can imagine this would work all right. Um, even though they're not proper nouns in the way the model is used to, it most likely would be able to learn the spans. Um, and then we probably try to do some sort of text classification model because um, remember, we're trying to figure out if the conditions are being benefited or if there's some sort of adverse effect from the drug. So except the text classification model isn't going to work when there are sentences with multiple conditions and different effects. So you'd need to do some sort of fancy slicing and cut down the sentences and then do text classification on the bits. Um, this would allow you to isolate the effects of certain conditions but it would be a bit of work to figure out where, how and where to cut, especially with a purely rule-based approach. Um, review data is a bit messier than this in practice. Um, so it's doable, but definitely not ideal. And just a little bit of a tangent, my colleague Edward talks about a lot of these problems on his blog on Healthy, which is his uh, project for medical supplements, um, sort of doing the same idea. So anyways, if we did this sort of pipeline, we'd have to do two components, the NER and the text classification, and there'd be lots of complications, lots of edge cases. So what if we try to think about this problem in a slightly different way? In this example, I not only want to extract the condition spans, the green ones, um, but also the entire phrase or span detailing the effect, whether it's positive or negative. So we'd have two different effect labels, and if we do this successfully, we'd be able to classify the segments with only one model instead of both an NER and a text classification component in our pipeline. This would make it a ton easier to see whether certain conditions are being benefited or worsened, and we wouldn't have to cut up the sentence at all like we would have in the last example um, because it's already done as part of the model training, the data labeling uh, process. 
However, we might begin to run into some problems if we try to use an NER model to learn to recognize these labeled spans. So even though you're still extracting these spans of text, um, there's a few reasons why NER models can't handle this sort of data. First of all, the effect spans, the benefit, and the ADE spans are rather arbitrary. They consist of sentence fragments and a lot of different syntactic units. They're longer than a NER model would normally deal with, and in some cases, most importantly, the effect and the condition spans overlap. There's an entity, quote unquote, within an entity. So these aren't the typical named entities in the first example, or even the somewhat okay condition spans that the NER model might be able to learn. This is something the NER model cannot do, simply by the way it was designed. Along with other things, the sequence-based NER model has a lot of edge sensitivity. So it predicts these single token-based tags that are very sensitive to boundaries, um, which is not very helpful for arbitrary or overlapping spans. So in order to solve my problem of extracting both the effects and condition spans from our text, we're gonna need to find another solution. And with that, I will introduce Spacey's span categorizer component, also known as SpanCat. Um, this is a trainable pipeline within Spacey's open source library and it can handle overlapping and arbitrary spans. So the Spacey team came up with a solution because they saw this need within the NLP community to label these non-named entity spans, um, applications like we just saw. And it's really cool what they've been able to accomplish with it. I'm gonna go into how SpanCat works and how to use it in a second, but first I wanna talk briefly about Spacey. So as I mentioned, uh, Spacey is the open source natural language processing library. If you don't know it, it's maintained by my lovely colleagues and me at Explosion. There's a lot I like about Spacey, but I'm gonna to focus today on the idea of customizability without compromising the developer experience. So within a Spacey project or pipeline, you have the option to change, add, update, customize all the components within your pipeline, um, but they still have sensible defaults when you first start. So the config file, uh, there's a configuration file that lays out all the different controls you can have for your project or components um, pipeline in one place. It's initialized with a set of defaults, as I said, but you can swap out everything um, to fit your problem and what you wanna do. Um, additionally, all the variables are named in the configuration file, so they're not hidden away under abstraction layers. Uh, we really do try to implement these customizable and transparent solutions. Uh, we find that really important. Um, and we can see this in SpanCat. So SpanCat would be part of your project pipeline. Um, this pipeline would include a tokenizer, either one from Spacey or even something else if you wanted. You can just swap that out in the configuration file. We'll see that a bit on the next slide. Um, the pipeline might also include some other components, such as a tagger or a parser, um, depending on your project and what you needed. So for example, in the following slides, we might see that there's an option to suggest subtree spans of a text within your SpanCat model and for that, for the subtrees, you might need a dependency parser within your pipeline. So you can just add that in your configuration file as well. Um, when you're getting started with SpanCat, you can use the add pipe uh, feature to either add the default SpanCat model or even add a custom SpanCat model as you have trained and defined in the configuration file. <laughs> um, okay, so on the Spacey website, there's this training quick start guide, and this allows you to generate a config file um, you choose the individual components with cute little checkboxes for your pipeline, and then it generates this file with the recommended settings. Um, the config file within our pipeline components has some pretty neat features. So I went over this a little bit, um, but it's a single source of truth for all your components. None of the variables are hidden behind abstractions, and all of the settings are in this one file. This makes it easier to see what's going on, not have stuff hidden under too many abstraction layers. It also gives you the flexibility to customize the architecture by simply swapping out components in the file. For example, you can swap out the suggestor function for SpanCat. We'll talk about that more in a bit um, by just changing its definition in the configuration. Something custom you have built, um, <coughs> excuse me, and then update all the dependent variables in the configuration as well. Okay. Whew. <coughs> There's more talking than I've done in a while. Okay, so there's, <clears throat> there's a few different ways to visualize these spans. Um, Prodigy is Explosion's annotation tool, and it is a great way to label this span data. So it has a built-in recipe to handle these labeled spans. Also, you can use this, <clears throat> uh, 
excuse me, you can use Displacy to visualize these spans as well. It simply loads up a web server and allows you to view these labeled spans. Um, visualization can be super helpful in debugging the training process, and then also having good data with consistent annotations is super important for model training, which is why I'm mentioning this. Oh. Okay, so let's go into a bit about how SpanCat works, um, what's going on under the hood. So SpanCat has two main parts, a suggester and a classifier. Oh, that is the wrong slide. A suggester and a classifier. The suggester, as the name might suggest, uh, suggests possible span candidates, and then it feeds them into the classifier, which then scores them. So there are several different possibilities for the suggester function, um, including a few purely rule-based approaches and then a more machine learning solution. Um, so we'll take the ngram suggester for now. You can set the ngram length for your data, and then it breaks the text up into chunks. So here we have uh, ngram length of two, and it's broken the text up into chunks of two tokens each. So then the classifier will take over, and this scores labeled predictions for each span. So it includes context from the whole ngram span, so in this case, the whole joint pain span. And that way, the classifier can catch important and informative words uh, from within the span. Um, so the individual spans are classified as one unit. Um, so although the tokens in the span use contextual representations, um, unlike the NER model, it is one unit instead of token-based. Um, so the classifier first starts with an embedding layer. Um, it takes token to vec representations um, to work with the um, words numerically. And then it goes through a pooling layer. Um, so within the so this reduces the spans and encodes the context. So within the outputted pooled array, there is a first token and a last token, and this marks the span boundaries. And then there is the mean of all the token to vec representations in the span to encode context, and then finally the max from each token to vec representation. <clears throat> so then the scoring later returns the model predictions and the label probabilities by performing this multi-label classification on the pooled span. Um, all right, so let's go back to the suggester function. Um, OK, so in the 0 0.5 release of Spacey Experimental, we added three rule-based suggester functions. Uh, the subtree suggester suggests spans based off their syntactic dependence. The chunks suggester suggests chunks using a noun chunk iterator. And then the sentence suggester suggests sentence spans. Um, additionally, there's the option to suggest spans based on NPM, as we saw. And then our machine learning approach to span suggestion is called span finder, and it identifies span boundaries by suggesting possible start and end tokens. So it suggests a lot fewer and more precise candidates than the ngram suggester, which does improve training time and memory usage for your SpanCat component. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out our Spacey Experimental repo on GitHub. Um, in practice, though, the method used to suggest spans, the classifier, depends a lot on the project you're doing. So you can bias your model towards a higher recall or precision by changing the amount of candidate spans there are, um, which is super cool, super, super cool. Um, OK. I think there's a delay in the slides. OK, there we go. Um, this is an example implementation of the ngram suggester. In this example, there are quite a few span candidates because we're taking all the possible spans of legs one, two, and three. So SpanCat will have a hard recall using this method because the number of span candidates is pretty high. Um, so if you wanted to have a lower recall and bias towards precision, um, span finder or the noun chunk iterator might be a better option. But again, it really depends on like your project and your use case and what you need and want. OK, so we'll go into a little bit of review, uh, the differences between NER and SpanCat, some of the things SpanCat does a bit differently. So as we just saw in the previous slides, SpanCat gives you explicit control over your candidate spans via the suggestor function and options. Um, this does allow you to bias your model towards precision or recall, uh, or even customize it further to fit your specific needs. Unlike the NER model, SpanCat returns the predicted label probabilities over the entire span, which gives you more meaningful confidences through threshold against. Um, so by including the context from the whole span uh, with the pooling layer, the classifier can catch important and informative words from within the span. 
Finally, and most importantly, there's a lot less edge sensitivity. These sequence-based NER models will typically predict single token-based tags that are sensitive to boundaries. This is effective in some cases for proper nouns, um, but not so helpful for phrases or overlapping spans, as we've seen. All in all, I'm super amazed by the solution that the Spacey team came up with for this NLP community to solve this problem. And it's really, really cool to see what problems it allows us to solve. Okay, so we have a lot of resources already out there about SpanCat, which I just wanted to point out. Um, we have amazing blog posts, um, a video, and some example projects in our projects repo. Um, we're also active on all the discussion forums. So if you're interested in any of this further, there's more for you and we're here for you too. All right, uh, thank you so much for listening. This was my first talk ever. So I really appreciate you being here. I was a little nervous. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions, but if there's anything further, I can be in the gather town afterwards or in the discord. So just ping me there. Thank you for presenting. And I could not tell this was your first talk. It was very, very well done. So, uh, and yes, Vincent in the chat says clap, clap, clap. Yep, indeed. Um, <laughs> great talk by you all. So we did have one question, uh, but looks like Vincent already answered it. Um, so this was about, oh, we have a lot of, lot of chat here. Um, it was around, we can span cat deal with split spans uh, referring to the same concept unit. So for example, uh, when the same concept is scattered between non-connected spans, example, it is required to perform a blood test before the checkup as part of the insurance instructions uh, to make sure that the patient has no prior conditions. Let me just maybe show this bit uh, because uh, this is the example. And uh, Vincent answered saying they would be identified as two different spans now, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Um, yeah, you would label them as two different separate spans. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so, oh, we have another question by Linny who asks, What's the difference between SpanCat and Label Studio? I actually am not aware of Label Studio. Uh, maybe Vincent knows <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, Vincent also says he'll be in uh, Gadget Town after. Perfect. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, we have, I think, one more. We have time for a question. So let's sh share. Jean-Pierre's question. Can we use PanCat to detect linguistic images? Example, I feel under a dark cloud. Dark cloud means depressed. Humans use these images all the time. I mean, um, you could definitely train a model to do this. SpanCat is more about the, the labeled span. So um, it would be really good for a dark cloud because that's not a super named entity like. Um, mm -hmm. So it would it would work well for labeling stuff like that and recognizing stuff like that, um, but it, it's all about what model you train the data you're training it on. Um, I mean, this is super hard in the the medical reviews, right? Because like people don't generally say exactly how they're feeling, how they're feeling. So this is definitely a problem like that needs to be solved. Yeah. Mm 